It's the Notch 6 online podcast, episode number 9, also known as the first annual Notch 6 Christmas Spectacular. Sit back, let's put it in Notch 6, it's time to celebrate the holidays. This is the Notch 6 online podcast. Notch 6 is the podcast dedicated to O-Gauge trains. Whether you're collecting, operating, or just getting started, Notch 6 is your home for O-Gauge news, events, and interviews. Now here is your host, Derek Thomas. Well, welcome to Notch 6, the only show on the internet dedicated to O-Gauge trains. Whether you set up your trains once a year around the Christmas tree or whether you run trains 365 days a year, we're the only O-Gauge podcast on the internet and we're proud to do it. Welcome to the first annual Christmas Spectacular. For me, this is personally my favorite time of year. And for most toy train collectors, this is where it all started is with a Christmas present. That's most of us, not all of us, but most of us. Trains and Christmas just kind of seem to go hand in hand. We have a great show for you today. And the guest on this episode is a guest that when I started this podcast, I had her in mind from day one. And that is renowned artist Angela Trotta Thomas, who has done some amazing work over the year painting Lionel Train. She's been at it 22 years. I have five or six of her prints in my basement and plan on adding many more. We're going to sit down and we're going to talk about Christmas painting trains and everything else that we think is fun to talk about. It's going to be a great interview. You have that to look forward to later in the show. Also, I encourage you to stick around for the last part of the show. I have a really, really big, fun surprise for you guys. All right, let's kick this show off with the news desk, a holiday edition. I've got a great tip for you, how to build a holiday musical car for under $20. That and so much more in the news desk. Keeping you up to date on everything that's coming down the tracks in the world of O-Gage, it's time for the Notch 6 News Desk. The News Desk is brought to you by the Lionel Collectors Club of America. Visit lionelcollectors.org for all the latest LCCA news. Kicking off the News Desk, just a reminder from our friends over at Project Roar, you have until the first of the year, so just a little under two weeks, if you call John Schmidt directly at Project Roar at 630-653-ROAR, at 630-653-7627, and mention the Notch 6 podcast, they're going to give you 50% off any of their in-stock books. And we made this announcement during the last episode of the show that John was on, and he said he would honor that until the first of the year, so just a little under two weeks left to take advantage of that deal. Some of the books that Project Roar offers include The Authoritative Guide to Lionel Promotional Sets, 1960 to 1969, The Authoritative Guide to Lionel Post-War Operating Cars, Inside the Lionel Fun Factory and a few other great titles that if you don't have them in your collection yet, you need to take advantage of them. Starting in January on Notch 6, I'll have a brand new segment for you guys. I mentioned this last month during the show and that's the On the Road to the LCCA National Convention in Indianapolis. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to build a section of the LCCA modular layout that will debut in Indianapolis in July of 2014. So this segment will take you through the design process, the actual construction, tips, tricks, things I learned along the way. And hopefully by the end of this, I'll have a pretty good feel for how these things go together. And hopefully we'll be able to encourage some of our listeners to take a crack at building one of these kits. Now I will tell you, having seen this layout come up and go down at the Lionel Open House in Canfield back in August... This is a really, really slick system, so I'm really looking forward to putting one of these modules together, and it really is a great time. It allows you to get together with a group of people who are like-minded, and it's one of those things that it's easy setup, easy teardown, and it lets you be creative too. So that's coming to the show in January. You have that to look forward to. My tip for this month is on building a musical holiday freight car or building for under $20. One of my favorite things to do is to scour the Lionel parts inventory on the Lionel.com site. And one of the things I've found, and this may be a little late for this year, but you can build a musical boxcar building, whatever you want to build with parts off of the Lionel website for under $20. So get your pen and paper out. Here's what you need. From the Lionel parts department, which you can order through Lionel.com, 
you need a 630-679-0010 soundboard. That'll cost you $10. And a 610-985-0536 for $6.50. That's 1650 total. That is the board, the 9-volt plug, the on-off switch, and the speaker for just under $17. Now, the cool thing about this setup is it's completely independent in terms of you don't need track power. It runs off a 9-volt, and you can put this inside of a boxcar, a building, anything that you can think of that you want to modify on your layout to play Christmas sounds. This little soundboard and speaker can be put inside it. The speaker is probably about a 2-inch diameter speaker and can fit in just about anywhere. The board is even smaller than that. It doesn't take a lot of room. For me, what I did is I put it in the fuel tank of a dummy GP9 locomotive that has a Christmas shell on it, and the on-off switch happens to be located in the fuel tank as well where the rail sound switch used to be. So to turn the car on and off, flip switch in the fuel tank, and off we go. It's really a pretty slick setup. It's cheap. So if you're looking for a fun and interesting project, I'll also post those part numbers on our Facebook page. So if you didn't get a chance to write them down, you can go to our Facebook page and look them up. You can also email me at notch6, N-O-T-C-H-S-I-X at gmail.com. I'll be happy to send you the part number. Or if you look up parts diagrams for the Lionel Holiday cars, the soundboards appear to be all the same throughout those holiday cars that have uh, music playing out of them. The other thing that I'll tell you about this project is the soundboard is pretty impressive. They fit a lot of different holiday tunes on one board, so it's not just the same song over and over. It goes through a loop of, I think, probably six or seven holiday songs. And so it's it's a pretty neat setup. So there's my uh, tip for you for this month, and I've got a great tip for you coming in the January edition of the show. Something that may end up, well, changing the way you look at your layout. We'll leave that for January. All right, on to our feature interview with Angela Trotta Thomas. She's been painting Lionel trains for over 20 years now, is well-recognized within the hobby, and at one time had a pretty amazing layout that actually my layout in the basement is based off of. We'll talk a little bit about that in the interview portion of the show. So sit back, relax. Here comes Angela Trotta Thomas on Notch 6. This is the Notch 6 online podcast, your home for O-Gage news, events, and interviews. Here again is Derek Thomas. Well, welcome back to the Notch 6 Christmas Spectacular. It's the first annual Christmas Spectacular, and I'm so happy to have as my guest, and this has been kind of my plan since day one. I'm so happy she said yes. Today on the show, Angela Trotta Thomas. Angela, welcome to the show. Welcome to the Christmas Spectacular. And believe it or not, you are the first female guest on this program, so congratulations. Well, thank you very, very much. I'm glad to be on the show. Glad to be able to get to talk to you and, and talk about something that I love to do, which is paint Lionel train memories. So, so thank you very much for having me. Well, we're so excited to have you here. I start every interview off with basically the same question. You've been painting toy trains for almost 22 years now, but that's not where you started at. Kind of tell me a little bit about your career before painting trains and how you got introduced to Lionel. Well, I've actually been painting professionally for more like closer to 40 years. About 22, no, actually about 25 years ago, I went back to uh, get my master's degree in painting. And actually, the Lionel artwork all came out of my master's degree. I, it was part of my research project that I was working on. Um, my husband is an avid Lionel train collector and also collects all the old catalogs. So when the time came to research something for my research project, it seems like a, uh, just a really good fit for us to look into all the old artwork that was done on all the old catalogs from the 50s. It was very evocative. It was very wonderful for young children to enjoy. When they, when they were looking at the, the, at the catalogs, they were really and truly feeling like they could have this little empire of their trains and cities and farms and, and such. And so what I decided to do was research that and find out what that was all about and why children were so moved by it. And then I also wanted to look into the, that Lionel Trains is such an American icon and been passed down to generations. It was the 
it was the toy that, for the most part, was not thrown away. Uh, I know that there are some horror stories out there of, of moms that did throw the trains away, but for the most part, these were pieces that were passed down, put you know, wrapped up after Christmas, put up in the attic, and passed down. And that intrigued me. And also, probably one of my favorite things to paint is uh, figurative art, particularly children. So it seemed like a, a, a just all around good fit. And my husband said he would help me with the research project, so that was the finishing touch. So that's how I ended up getting involved with Lionel Trains. Now, your husband, Bob, did he introduce you to Trains in terms of when you guys got married? Did he have Trains already, or was that something that came along later? Well, no. I, I mean, I was introduced to Trains the same way that most of us were. We, my dad always put Trains under a tree at Christmas time. And the fact that when I got married, my husband wasn't, you know, he was already into trains. He did not have a collection at that point, but he had talked constantly about getting a collection of Lionel trains. So actually, I was the one who bought him his first Lionel train as an adult, as a gift. And that started the whole ball rolling. And that was very early on when we were first married. We were only married, it was probably the late 70s when I bought him his first post-war train. It was... um it was the Lackawanna FM, and that started the whole ball rolling. <laughs> so it wasn't it wasn't one of those situations where you married a guy that already had a massive train collection. This was something that started small and has blossomed over over the decades now into something that's really pretty remarkable. Yes, the interest was always there, the desire was always there on his part, but he was a typical young guy that had gotten away from trains. I mean, when he was little, of course, trains were, you know, always under the tree. My husband's father passed away when he was very, very young, so he had some trains, but not a lot of trains because they really couldn't afford the trains, but all his friends had trains, and it was very much part of his Christmas memories to go over to all his friends and run all their trains. And he, I think, always really wanted to have his own big layout. And I think that was born as he was a child and never went away, even through his teen years and his early adult years when, obviously, there were a lot of other interests as well. He came back, I think, after we got married when we started to think about a family. And so that's how he, that's how we well, then we sort of grew together with it. Now, as you finished your master's degree, and obviously you had studied Lionel as a subject, when did you suddenly realize that, hey, wait a second, I can do this for a career. I can get out of commercial art, and suddenly I can paint trains, and, and this is going to work. Actually, I didn't really come up with that. My husband came up with that first. When, I had, um, when he was helping me do so much of his work, I did a small painting. It was one of my very first paintings. It was called Christmas Memories. And I did it as a little gift for him. And when he saw it, he just loved it. And he went and got some copies made of it and put it in a, a you know, a calendar. I don't even remember what year this was. It was it was probably around ninety, ninety one, somewhere probably around there. And he was he was the one who saw the first bit of potential, but it was actually Nick Ladd who had been a past president of TCA that really saw the potential. He had, uh, my husband had given the librarian at the TCA uh, one of these little calendars that had the picture of Christmas memories in it, and Nick Ladd was in the library one day at the TCA museum, saw the, uh, cal- the calendar, and said, I want to talk to her, <laughs> get her on the phone. <laughs> so basically... Nick was the one who said, I want you to come down. Uh, he was, at the time, he was marketing, he was the head of marketing at John Wanamaker's in Philadelphia. And he said, I want you to come down, do a, few, do a few more of those paintings. He said, and come down and see me. He said, we need to talk. So I said, okay. So there I went. I did a few more paintings, and it was actually window wishing and on schedule. I think I did Milk Run at that point. They were my first very early prints. And we made a little appointment to go down and visit with Nick Ladd and went into the office and he just flipped over the art and he said, now, he said, these have to be limited edition prints. He said, they can be Christmas cards later, but you have to start with limited edition prints. <laughs> it, was like, <laughs> it was just more than I ever anticipated. We, I think my husband saw the potential before I saw the potential. And then 
He said, yeah, well, Nick, Nick had suggested that I get in touch with Lionel and get their blessing. And so I, we wrote a letter, we put up a letter, put a letter together and sent it out to Lionel. And at the time, Dick Cohn was the owner of Lionel Trains. And um, I heard back in about a week that they loved the paintings and that they were going to license me. And I was more shocked than I can even explain. <laughs> but it's been very good. And I've been, you know, partnered with the company for the last 22 years. So I, I really, it's been a wonderful ride, so to speak. Tell me about your first time painting a toy train. Was there a learning process to it, or did it come naturally to you? Well, I would say the first time was the painting that I did, which was Christmas Memories. And that painting is a little looser than many of my other paintings, so it was more free form. And I it kind of just set the tra- I just set the trains up underneath the tree, and did, took a little snapshot and worked from that. So it, it did come naturally. Then when I started getting really into it, luckily I've always been able to paint or to draw technical things pretty well, and I was intrigued by the whole you know the train the the, the the technical part of the train. So that was a challenge, but I've loved doing it. I've, I've, I love the, the change between the technical part of the train engine and then the softness of a child playing with the train. I'm really interested in the emotional attachment that the children have, and well, and adults as well, but that people have about the toy trains and what they mean to them and how they how they make them feel. And so I knew that I had to have the trains correct because I know the collectors want to see the trains uh, the, the way they really are. But I, I hope that my paintings have transcended that a little bit more into um, the emotional impact because that's really where my focus is and always has been. Let's expand off of that idea a little bit. It's very clear in, in the way you talk and in, in interviews I've heard with you in the past, it's very clear that it's the memories that are tied to the toy trains that really drive the paintings. And, and it's it's neat to hear you talk about that. Uh, do you have any favorite stories that stand out over the years from uh, people you've consigned artwork for or, or customers that have just told you stories? What are some of your favorite memories that you've heard that are attached to your work? Well, first of all, if I hear the if I hear a memory enough times from many different people, then of course I know it's more of a universal type memory. So those are the memories that I've really tried to zero in on to depict in my paintings uh, because I know that they're going to strike a chord with many people. I always enjoyed the memories of everyone telling me about uh, being able to go down to the local hardware store or the department store and obviously getting the new catalog, but being able to see the trains in the window. Not only at Christmas time, but all year round. Uh, Christmas time, of course, is, you know, the best time. Whenever the trains would come out and they'd be, it, they would be put in the window, it, it was uh, typically window wishing. And that's kind of where window wishing the painting was born, is, is uh, being able to go down. And obviously, uh, these trains were very expensive at the time, and probably most children wished for them and never never to get them. So, um, or didn't get them as a child, I should say. So that's how the window wishing. Uh, and I've had I've had so many men come up to me after the painting was painted and say, "That's a painting of me. You painted me." And High Hopes is another painting that resonates with many collectors and and makes them feel like I actually zeroed in on their their memory and their their love for the trains, and that I painted them. That was one of them. Another one was that many of the children didn't get a chance to play with the trains under the tree because Dad was always playing with the trains under the tree. So there's a painting I did that's called My Turn Yet, Dad, that depicts that memory. And and I've had many, 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 many people come up to me and say, boy, was that the way it was. So so that's how I've, I've actually painted things that people have told me have been their their uh, memories and, and their love and their emotional attachment to the train, whether it be just my husband or many other people. But over the years, so many people have given me so many great ideas to depict. I, I have tried to depict just about everyone that I've heard. That's where the beginning of the painting comes from, let's put it that way. Then I have a lot of work to do after that. 
You're listening to Angela Trotta Thomas on the Notch 6 online podcast. Now, one thing that I've got to talk about, and you and I have talked about this uh, on our own outside of the show before, at one time you and your family had your basement set up like a hobby shop with a really impressive layout as the centerpiece. Tell me about that layout for the people who've never seen it and how you came up with and executed that idea. Well, that layout was, uh, again, born from window wishing, painting window wishing, which is probably my most iconic painting. I guess if you'd have to say what what painting would people really remember the most, it would be window wishing. And when we decided to do the, our layout as a like an old hobby shop, actually a, a hardware store is what we, what we had it depicted as, we had carpenters come in to, um, you know, finish off the room, and then, of course, my husband did the layout. But what it was in the basement, so uh, I remember telling him, I want you to um, cover up the real windows, and I want you to build a fake window that's four by eight in the wall, and I want you to put a door on the wall that goes just that goes to nowhere. And this poor carpenter was so confused. He didn't know what in the world I was talking about. And I said, you come back when it's finished and you'll understand. And he did, and he loved it. But that's sort of how we decided. We wanted to really pick up on the whole idea of children trained looking in the window. So I painted life-size children looking in the 4 by 8 window, and then a kind of a, a back, back street. The, the, the background was a street of... The, all the stores across the street, which depicted many of the, well, my children were my my father, many people's stores. Or, you know, I named the stores after many of the people in my life at the time. So that's how that painting came together. And then in the door that was in the wall, I actually painted a, a life-size child walking in the door. So when you opened the door, you could see the whole child, and he was walking in the door. And then we set up the whole layout inside so that it looked like they, you know, they actually were looking in the window at the, at the trains running. Very neat. Now, you guys moved to a warmer climate a little while back, and from what I understand, the layout no longer exists. Any plans for another layout at the new home? Well, actually, we downsized. Uh, we do have, my husband has his train room slash man cave where he has all his trains displayed, and he has his fly fishing flies and all that sort of stuff, but there's not room in that room for an actual layout. So what we've been doing to kind of fill that need is each year he builds a, um, about a, an 8 by 8 layout for the gallery that I show my paintings at uh, right down here in uh, Charleston, and it's, it's uh, called Coco Vivo Fine Art. It's uh, 25 Broad Street right in Charleston, and each year right after, actually right around Thanksgiving, we put up this layout and then it runs until the first of uh, the next year. So that's sort of filling his need, if you will, for setting up a layout. Uh, other than that, we have, you know, just the trains on display. You've created numerous catalog covers for Lionel over the years. Kind of walk me through that process. Do they give you a basic idea to start with? Or do you, at this point, do you have free reign in terms of you paint and you bring them something and then they decide yes or no? No, you know what, what? The way we work is we well, obviously we talk about it first and come up with um, you know a, a very loose concept. Like this past year with Santa, and uh, he was looking at the general, and it's called Santa's letter. There's a letter on the table by the milk and cookies, and Santa is just setting up the uh, general on the table close to the, the milk and cookies. And basically, the way that came up was we decided. You know, I, I kind of talked to them and I said, why don't we do something with Santa? And, you know, obviously Santa's such a, you know, <laughs> he, he, he's really an important guy. So we decided that would be the best way to go. And then, they, then we talked about, well, what engine would be the right engine? And Lionel kind of guided me on that one. And then they sent me the engine to work from. And... Then I put it together. What I did is, and this is the way I do all my private commission paintings as well, I obviously talk to the client, ask them for the proper, you know, I kind of walk them through the process of giving me the right pictures, the right um, photographs and all that sort of thing. And then from from what we've talked about and what I have to work with, I do a detailed pencil drawing. And that pencil drawing then is sent out for their approval. So that I work the same way with Lionel. I send out a, a pencil drawing for their approval, and um, then once it's approved, we do the paint. I do the painting. 
So that's that's pretty much my process. This way, everyone's happy in the end. If they really like the pencil drawing, they're going to love the painting because it is obviously, hopefully, even better than the pencil drawing. But then they actually do keep, get to keep the pencil drawing, too, so they actually do end up with two pieces of art. Oh, neat. Now, just out of curiosity, roughly what kind of time goes into a catalog cover, let's say, just to shoot from the hip on that? Well, it depends on the detail, uh, obviously. In, in all my paintings, it depends on the detail. But once the concept is decided, then I have to gather what I call the puzzle pieces. And the puzzle pieces are the train, obviously. Models, if I, if I need models, if I need children, or if I need someone to model for Santa Claus. Whatever you know, whatever whatever people I need, I have to gather that together. And then I try to set up the whole piece with all the with all the parts and photograph it all together. But that's not always possible. Sometimes I have to go back through all my reference over the years because I've obviously got a lot of reference now, and I might have to pull a child out of you know one of my old reference photos and put it together, or I might have to pull up you know some accessories to add to. Uh, the layout if I don't have a particular piece that I want to put in it. Um, for the most part, we have quite a few trains, so I, I do have most of my reference, but there's, every once in a while there's a piece we don't have. So uh, I, the client will either send it to me, and Lionel obviously sends me whatever I need, or um, I will work from old reference that I have. So and then, and then after I get that all together, then I photograph everything. At that point, then I, may, I start doing this. I start doing the drawing, and the drawing I take a lot of artistic license. Like it's not, it's not exactly like any photograph. I might take, you know, I might take a hundred photographs, and I might take one part out of one photograph, another part out of another photograph that works seems to work better, or I might change something altogether from, you know, from my imagination. But the photographs are kind of a kicking off point for me, and obviously because they have to be the trains have to be correct, I do need proper reference for the, you know, the trains. So that's, that's how I start. And then once I do the pencil drawing, then I go to the painting. So time-wise, so, I mean, you know, I can, anywhere from a couple of weeks to a couple of months. It's hard to, it's hard to say. It depends on what's, you know, what's on my workload at the time, too. I, I never really work on one thing at a time. I usually have two or three, sometimes four different projects going at a time. So it's kind of hard to, if, if you check the new how many hours is in something, it's kind of hard for me to even tell you because I, I work on so many different things at one time. I don't ever really keep track of it. You know, I kind of know how long things are going to take me, and I, I know, I know, for example, like steam engines are going to take me a lot longer than, say, an F3, you know, uh, to paint. So I take that into consideration when I'm pricing things. Uh, but other than that, you know, children are children, and I kind of know how, how, pretty much how quickly I can paint a child. So it depends on the detail, and it probably depends most of the time on how many how many either trains or accessories or train items are in it. That actually takes more time than than the children. Now, here's an interesting question. After 20-plus years of painting numerous, countless trains, have you decided on a personal favorite for yourself? I'd probably have to say window wishing just because it was – it's actually really a portrait of my son as he was at seven years old. So for me, that means even more to me than the fact that it, you know, it resonated with so many other people. So I'd probably have to say that one. But um, some of the newer pieces, the, uh, the oil paintings that I've been doing, there's a, a new one called Imagination that's a little boy looking down at a blue comet I, I kind of really like. I, I mean, I'm looking at paintings, the paintings that I'm doing from many different standpoints at this point and looking at them. Obviously, if, if they had an emotional impact, if they're if they're drawn well, if they're painted well. But I also want to make sure I'm painting them well. You know, I want I want I, I've been working hard actually for the last 22 years. I've taken many workshops and and I I'm constantly trying to up my game and the ability of my of my art. So um, I'm looking at that from like you know standpoint of. Is the art good? Is the is the you know is the painting strong? Is the is the com composition good? Those are the kind of things that um, are really helping me, you know, to become a better artist. 
Let's go off on a technical tangent for a second. You may have to correct me if I'm wrong here, but in the past couple of years, you've switched mediums in terms of uh, you're working primarily with oils now. Is that correct? Yes, yes. I guess around maybe seven or eight years ago, I, I made a kind of a long transition where I was doing both watercolors and oils, and now I'm just doing strictly oil painting. It just, I think I just needed a change, and I'm really, really enjoying oil painting at this point in time. It's not to say I wouldn't do watercolor if somebody specifically wanted a watercolor, you know, painting done of their child, and, and they preferred that medium. I would absolutely, you know, be happy to do that. But I, I prefer at this point to paint in oil. Does and and this is just my own personal observation, but it seems like an oil, and and I've studied both you know sets of work from the watercolors to the oil. It seems like oil kind of makes the trains pop a lot more. Is that kind of your observation, or what makes oil a, a different kind of medium to work in? Watercolor is just totally by nature a softer medium, and it's you know I actually worked with watercolor in probably the strongest. How can I put this? I was getting the most opaque kind of coloring that you probably can get with watercolor in my early uh, watercolor paintings. But oil, you can get so much more vibrant color and so much more, uh, if, if you choose to do that. And, and obviously with some of the trains and some of the bright colors of the trains, I am choosing to push and punch the color up more. So they become more um, dimensional, if you will. Sometimes actually less detailed than the watercolors, but more vibrant and I'm kind of enjoying not not worrying as much about all the tight detail and getting more of the feel and the emotion and the flavor of the paint and the and the color to tell the story. All right, since this is a Christmas spectacular and you clearly have some affinity for Christmas themes in your paintings, we've got to switch gears for a minute. Tell me about some of your favorite Christmas memories growing up. What sticks with you after all these years? Well, obviously, I mean, I was I was a typical kid in the 50s that went and looked in the windows at, at uh, really wasn't looking at the trains. I was looking at the dolls, but it really was part of what you did at Christmas time, and we did it. Our family did it. Now, my dad actually did put up trains at Christmas, so I do remember them. As we got older and had our own family and we started putting the trains up and my own children were, were enjoying them, that actually meant more to me to watch the trains. And one of my one of my most cherished memories was the Christmas before my mother passed away. She came um, to our house and we had put up a, a really detailed layout that year under the tree. And I can still picture her sitting there. I mean, probably didn't move for an hour watching the trains and enjoying the trains. And that just that really meant a lot to me. That memory. I, I do remember that every time I see trains under a tree. So, but that was a later one. That wasn't that wasn't really as a child. As a child, I probably have most of the typical memories of you know the anticipation of Christmas and going to see Santa and 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 of course you know uh, having a list <laughs> that usually was too long for anybody to fill. <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> but I actually you know I was a very fortunate young young kid and I I did get a lot of nice Christmas gifts. I was I was actually more fortunate than my husband was because his father passed away so young. So I am grateful for those memories and and I'm I'm and I think because my husband wanted to train so much, it actually changed the way our our parenting was with our children and having trains be such a part of, of our family life. So it, it it ended up being a good thing, you know, with the uh, with the whole emotional attachment of the trains. You said something earlier in the interview that I think it stuck out to me, and that is toy trains were a toy that for some reason never got thrown away after Christmas. Most of them have been packed up, handed down, and you're right, you know, there are the occasional stories and a lot of them of moms that sold the trains to the kid down the street or sent them out with the garbage man, things like that. Why do you think that, Toy trains were the ones that were packed up. Why do you think that link remains between toy trains and Christmas so many decades later? I think that link is because of the participation of the family. For the most part, the, the family 
all together put the trains up, and it was part of it was part of the tradition of setting the tree up, which obviously the tree has become such you know it's such a tradition. The trains became part of that same tradition, and obviously they were not little in, inexpensive plastic toys that got broken and thrown away. They were heavy. They were metal. They were uh, made for longevity. They were made to, to keep running and to keep playing with. So they, they were really too, if you will, too expensive and too much quality of a toy to throw away. So I think between the two things, it ended up just being part of the American fabric and becoming um, a tradition in Christmas holiday. I think you're absolutely right. To wrap this up, you've got a wide range of prints available. I'll be the first one to admit I have about six of them around the house, and you're the one train-related thing that is allowed out of the basement. If somebody is interested in having a painting commission or wants to order a print, what's, where should they go? Where's the best place to contact you? They can they can visit my website, which is my name. So it's www.angelatradathomas.com. Or they can call me anytime. Feel free. I'm, you know, I'm happy to chat and go over some of your ideas. If you have ideas for a possible painting, if you want to just order a print, whatever the case may be. And my phone number is 570-510-0082. And also you can email me anytime, and that's A-T-T-A-R-T at AOL.com. You've been listening to Angela Trotta Thomas on the Notch 6 podcast, the first annual Christmas spectacular. Angela, thank you so much for your time, and Merry Christmas to you and your family. Thank you very, very much for having me. I really enjoyed this interview, and I wish all of you a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Thank you so much, Derek. All right, welcome back to the Notch 6 Christmas Spectacular. And the reason we even put the word spectacular on it is for the reason that you are all about to hear. Direct from Santa's workshop in Concord, North Carolina, the big elf himself, Mike Reagan. Merry Christmas, Mike. Thanks, Eric. Merry Christmas to you. <laughs> I tell you what, you you have been a busy elf for the past few months, and we appreciate you taking the time to come and, and share a Christmas story with the Notch 6 listeners. Thanks again for being here, and uh, hopefully as we roll into 2014, things slow down a bit for you and uh, you get your chance to catch your breath. But again, thanks for being here to share the story. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the whole reason we call this the Christmas Spectacular, Mike Reagan and the night before Christmas. It was the night before Christmas, and in the roundhouse, not an engine was stirring, not even a mouse. The tenders were filled with anthracite fare in hopes that a Lionel Vision Line big boy soon would be there. The operators were nestled, all snug in their beds, while visions of train sets danced in their heads, and Lenny in his kerchief, and I with my dog, Little Rover, shut down our layouts for a long evening's layover. When up in the attic there arose such a clatter, I sprang from my chair to see what was the matter. Away to the attic I flew with straight standing hairs, tore open the door, and walked up the stairs. The moonlight on the breast of a new fallen snow gave the luster of midday to objects I know, when what to my wondering eyes should appear but a Lionel layout and eight tiny reindeer. When the little old driver and a big boy, so nimble and quick, I knew in a moment that it must be St. Nick. More rapid than lightning, he fired his big boy. It whistled and smoked and sounded with joy. Now Dasher, now Dancer, now Prancer and Vixen, on Comet, on Cupid, on Donner, and Blitzen. To the reindeer car at the top of the wall, now dash away, dash away, dash away all. Now we have a top-notch fireman from the North Pole called out, and a loco with enough tractive effort to carry us out. Santa left the big boy and boarded his sleigh. He handed down orders and gave me a wave. Then up to the housetops he merrily flew, with a sleigh full of trains and fast-track switches too. 
The reindeer were working their pachyderm best, and Santa gushed with holiday zest. They were dressed all in fur from their heads to their feet, and their clothes were tarnished with ashes and sleet. Bundles of trains they slung on their backs, and they looked just like peddlers opening their packs. Santa with a broad face and a round little belly that shook when he laughed like a bowl full of jelly. His cheeks were like fire, his nose like a cherry. His goal this night was to make people merry. They spoke not a word and went straight to their work. They set up the layouts with not a quirk. By Santa laying his finger aside his nose, both up the chimneys they merrily rose. And once on their way, Santa yelled in his plight, Merry Christmas to all, and to all a good night. Ladies and gentlemen, Merry Christmas from everybody at Notch 6. Merry Christmas from all your friends at Lionel. And Merry Christmas to all, and to all a good night. Thanks for listening to Notch 6. You can find us on Facebook for all the latest news and previews of our next show. Be sure to subscribe to the show on iTunes so you'll receive the show as soon as it's posted. If you have any questions or comments, email notch6 at gmail.com. That's N-O-T-C-H-S-I-X at gmail.com. We'll see you again soon. Until then, be sure to keep it in Notch 6.